to record it. Okay, good. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to Nature Guelph. Um, my name is Val Wyatt and I'm the regional coordinator for the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas Wellington region here. Um, tonight's talk will be all about the atlas. And of course, that's the Atlas of the Breeding Birds of Ontario. Oh, yes. As we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the ancestral lands of several First Nations. We recognize the significance of the dish with one spoon covenant to this land and offer our respect to our First Nations, Métis and Inuit neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. Now, the motto of Nature Guelph is to connect people with nature and inspire them to protect it. Now, some time ago, Nature Guelph had a bird group. We called it the Bird Wing. And with the Atlas starting up this year, we thought it a great time to renew it. Um, bringing the Atlas activities under the umbrella of Nature Guelph seems to make a lot of sense. It's a great partnership allowing naturalists to connect with each other. And also, I am grateful to Nature Guelph for funding this platform tonight. Uh, and any support they can provide in the future as we can get together in person and do some field trips together. Many of you are already members of Nature Guelph, or perhaps you've only heard of this through the Atlas and have never heard of Nature Guelph. But uh, all our programs are free and open to the public. But if you like what you see and you're in a position to do so, please do consider joining as a member or, or supporting us through donations. Um, both options are available online or by mail at those, uh, the details there. All right. I On can't hear you. Atlas. Okay. Um, yes, is anyone else having difficulty with the sound? Yes. Uh, is it a matter of needing to speak? Uh, there's a chat right there, yes. Sounds fine. Oh, yeah, no problem with the sound. Can you click on the chat? Okay, great. Thank you for all the comments. Good. We've got the chat figured out. I will speak loudly. It uh, may be an issue of, on individual computers then. Uh, I guess everyone is see is everyone seeing that chat box in the middle of the screen? Oh, no, we can't. No, <laughs> yeah. All right, good. Um, I guess I should uh, right off the bat introduce my husband, Paul Grant, who many of you will also have known. And he's here to assist me monitoring the chat, I hope. <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna click him up. And uh, also help me out with the uh, yeah, NC chat. Good. Um, yes, he's going to also help me answer any questions about the second part of the presentation, which deals with our trip to Northern Ontario, because he was there 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good. Well, I am feeling a little intimidated. Uh, it's been a long time since I've presented and I've never done a presentation uh, on Zoom. We've got well over 100 people uh, registered and, and they all seem to have shown up uh, as well. We have the previous regional coordinator for Wellington County, my father, Brian Wyatt. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, assistant regional coordinator for much of the last atlas for the whole province, Nicole Kopish in the audience. And of course, we have Mike Cadman, who has coordinated all three of the entire atlases of the Breeding Birds of Ontario. So I am a little overwhelmed, but nonetheless, we will proceed. Good. Um, so tonight I'll be giving an overview of the Atlas uh, protocols and an introduction to the resources you can find online. Um, we'll use the chat for questions and if there's time at the end, I'll try to get to those. It will be difficult to cover everything and I imagine some topics that may come up will be more, more suitable for future workshops. Uh, that portion should take about 30 minutes and then after that, it'll be followed by a slideshow of our trip to Northern Ontario for the second Breeding Bird Atlas in 20, uh, 2002. Yes, and that will take another 30 minutes. Um, that will end the formal part of the program. And I know many of you are from out of the region um, and you may wish to leave at that time, which is fine. Uh, we had also thought about having, uh, having some discussion as to the 
the new renewed bird wing um, looking for volunteers. I'm worried that the crowd is a little too big for that. So we may just have to set that aside for a different meeting. Anyways, let's proceed then. So this is the purpose of the Atlas quite simply is to document the distribution and relative abundance of the approximately 300 species of breeding birds in Ontario. It's going to run from now through 2025 and it follows the two previous atlases conducted in uh, starting in 1981 and 2001. Atlasing is just like birding. It's keeping checklists, but with more information collected regarding evidence for breeding. Goal is to find every species that breeds in a given area. Now, as I'm sure you're all well aware, Ontario's a vast, huge and varied with respect to habitat and accessibility. It's a gigantic undertaking, but a methodical approach has worked in the past. The entire province has been divided into 10 by 10 kilometer squares, uh, the universal trans transverse mercator system. Um, in Southern Ontario, with its higher population density and variety of habitats, each of its squares will be surveyed quite intensively. In the parts of the province where there's still road access, but many fewer people, just a representative sample of the squares in each 100 by 100 kilometer block will be surveyed, perhaps 5% or so. And in the far north, which is very difficult to access, but where the habitat is quite uniform, a smaller sample still, perhaps 2% of the squares will be surveyed. So to manage survey coverage, the province is divided into regions, each with a regional coordinator. And Wellington is just in the middle of the mixed wood plain, of course, in Southern Ontario. So this is a map of uh, region 47, Wellington, going all the way from south of Cambridge and north on Highway 6, all the way up to Varney. 30 of the 31 squares have already been assigned a primary atlaser although birders are welcome to submit data wherever they happen to be birding. As I mentioned before, atlasing is birding, but with more details. So it's important that all the habitats in a square are visited. The primary atlaser will ensure that it's appropriately covered. And the atlas is asking for a minimum of 20 hours of coverage in the appropriate seasons. Over the five years, that's not too onerous. Um, in the last atlas, 2001 to 2005, birding effort in Wellington squares ranged from 40 hours, a minimum of 40 hours per square, to over 200 hours. Um, there were 167 species documented in this county last time, and uh, 165 species in the first atlas in the 1980s. Now, that's only a difference of two species, but in reality, there's quite a bit of turnover uh, between those two years. I started looking into it. I find it very interesting and I quickly realized that that would be a whole presentation in itself is the difference um, in the bird uh, distribution between uh, the first atlas in the 80s and the second atlas in the early 2000s. Uh, just to give you a taste of what was different in the first atlas species that were only present then included half a dozen species of waterfowl, and then some grassland birds like short-eared owl, the endangered species Henslow sparrow and loggerhead shrike, which unfortunately have only declined again since. Um, Red crossbill was also seen during the, was also recorded breeding in the first atlas and was not in the second atlas. Now with the eruption we've been having recently, I would encourage everyone to read the crossbill information on the Breeding Bird Atlas homepage because it's an excellent opportunity to try and document breeding of crossbills again. And it starts at this time of year. Uh, you can probably guess some of the birds that were present in the second atlas that were not present in the 1980s. And that would be uh, just to name a few, uh, mute and tundra swans, wild turkey, bald eagle, red-bellied woodpecker, common raven and Carolina wren. Generally, there were an average of 100 or so species breeding in each of these squares. Uh, the lowest total was recorded down in Elmira. Uh, the highest total, of course, at 135 species was the square that includes Luther Lake. 
So equally important to, do, to making sure all the species are captured is to document the highest level of breeding. Breeding evidence is documented according to internationally standardized codes into these three categories of possible, probable, and confirmed. And within the categories, the breeding evidence is also ranked. So for example, a species observed in suitable nesting habit during its breeding season is possibly breeding there. If the bird is singing in suitable nesting habitat during the, spe the species breeding season, it's a slightly better possibility that it would be breeding. And there are some, there, this is available on the website, but you can see other codes representing different indica indicators of breeding. If uh, a bird is singing on territory more than a week apart, perhaps dis courtship displays or distraction displays, visiting a probable nest site all indicate probable breeding and breeding can be confirmed if you are able to see recently fledged youngs or even better finding the nest itself containing eggs or young. The results of the first atlas were published in quite a large book. So the results of the data from each square for each species uh, are, were included along with uh, a species account and a map then showing the breeding distribution of the species. For the first time, we were able to see the distribution of birds in the province, each species. Second atlas uh, resulted in an even larger book. And it brought the introduction of point counts, to try and assess relative abundance. And I believe that Ontario was the first atlas in North America to, to attempt this. Um, point counts, I'll just briefly describe, consist of a five minute stationary count of all the birds that you see or hear within a distance. So you're recording both the type and number uh, using that, plus the area of your count circle, relative abundance can be determined. 25 point counts is the target for the target uh, for the squares. And uh, point counts do require experienced birders that know all of the possible birds, certainly by sight, and ideally 80% or more of the birds that are likely to occur by sound. Now we do have volunteers available in Wellington. Um, many, some of them are on this call tonight and they're highly qualified to conduct point counts, although they are not primary atlasers. We do need people with uh, sharp hearing and a good knowledge of songs. So if any, um, Atlaser would like assistance, we've got volunteers that can step right in on that point count option. And the second atlas then also had for each species, a species account, a distribution map. What new was this relative abundance map in the top right. You can see for the Savannah Sparrow listed here that the highest relative abundance was for the species was in the, the agricultural areas of southwestern Ontario, but again also up near the uh, Hudson's Bay lowlands. Although the nuts and bolts of the fieldwork haven't changed a lot since the last atlas, there's a huge difference in the way the atlas has been structured online. Um, to get started then or now, you just need a few things. An instruction manual or something to tell you what to do, a map of where you're going, and some way to record your data. Now, although you can still use the paper forms like last time, the online options are available for collecting just an incredible amount of data and it's quite exciting. So I'm going to quickly run through the website to show where these resources can be found. Good. If you search for the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, this is the website that will come up. It's the birdsontario.org homepage for the, for the atlas. And just as an aside before I show you the rest of it, under Atlas, atlas Archives and View Species Maps, you are able to check for... Okay, let's see here. There's nothing, there's no slide here. There's uh, nothing. You need to do share. Oh, thank you, you thank you. Share. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see here. This one. 
screen New share? share? Oh. No, that'd be... Yeah. yeah. That works. <laughs> All right, good. This <laughs> is the page that you will come to if you search for the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. And before we start, this is the home page. Good idea to check in here for things that are new, including the crossbill information I just mentioned. But before I go through the rest, I just wanted to let you know that all of the information from the previous two atlases is right here. Um, breeding evidence for both atlases and then the relative abundance maps for the species. There's just so much available online. I'm just so excited about it. Uh, so the first thing we need is the instructions, the instruction manual under tools and resources. I won't go through a detailed explanation of the atlasing um, because it's all there and it's very good. One really interesting attachment is safe dates. And this is simply a list by eco region. So I'm gonna scroll right down to mixed wood plain where we're located in this is a list of the dates in which species are breeding, or you can safely assume that they're breeding. So here you can see at this time of year, the rock pigeon would be breeding. The shaded areas are when they're possibly breeding or on migration, and they're absent other times of the year. Good. Uh, the best part of this page though, is if you scroll down to the bottom, there are two instructional videos. Uh, the one at the bottom is how to load and use the Nature Count app. This is compatible, entirely compatible with eBird. And those of you who have used eBird before will find it very straightforward. Actually, I don't use eBird a lot and I still find it very straightforward. Just above it is a video uh, for doing the data submission online. If you prefer to go out and record in a notebook or perhaps on the old forms, you can come back to your desk and submit your data online. For those who prefer paper, there are Atlas forms here. Region 47 is Wellington, and this will be familiar to anyone who used the previous Atlas. Uh, it's a list of all the species that did or could likely breed in the region. It's got indicators here of significant species, provincially rare, perhaps regionally rare, birds that need additional documentation. And then it's got a quick summary of breeding evidence codes in the bottom. Good, so that page has Pretty much everything you need on how to read, how to atlas. I'm now going to go through to Square Resources and you'll see that I am being transferred to birdscanada.org. I did find that a bit confusing at first, but uh, it's quite straightforward. Now you can use this map to zoom in and find the number of any square, or if you already know it, you can type it in. A nice feature is that you can save squares that you frequently visit. So to enter data, it's very quickly, very quick. So here I've identified the square I live in as my home square. And then we jump straight to it and see number of resources available for this square. Um, you'll notice two things right away about this and that's the abundance of red flags. And those are the eBird hotspots. Extremely, extremely helpful. Um, there are also blue numbered flags, and those are the point count locations, the prioritized point count locations um, that represent, that will uh, be representative of the habitat in the square. I'm going to click through on the map, and this is then you, you come up with a beautiful topographic base map that's got all the habitats shown with, of course, the topography shown in the yellow lines. The uh, green is forest and green with the little shrubby sign is wetland. Uh, built up areas, roads, everything are shown. Uh, tracks, trails are as well. And it also has 50 
point counts. Uh, the point count protocols will be finalized uh, soon. <laughs> They're not finalized now, but they'll be finalized before the breeding season starts in May. Good. So going Oops. Sorry. I'm... There we go. There we are. Okay. So I had downloaded the PDF map to get to that previous square. You can download the point counts coordinates uh, so that you can have them in your in the field and help you locate them. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show on this was the square summary sheet. It was a bit slow to load up before, so I think I've got it. No. There it is. So for my home square of 17NJ61, it's got a summary of all of the birds that were recorded in the previous atlas. It's got the highest breeding evidence that was attained. And then it's also got what species have been recorded now for the third atlas. You'll see there's one species at the top in the summary and a probable breeding. So oh, what could that be? Scrolling down there it is. It's the great horned owl. And that's one of my records. I heard a pair duetting out on my back uh, porch in early January. And because there were two and because they were interacting, that uh, hopefully counts as a pair. We'll make sure when the OWL protocol is released. we go. All right. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah. So now on to the submission. I'm going to very quickly walk through this because again, those videos are excellent and have a very nice step-by-step -step approach and you can watch it at your leisure. Uh, I would note right off the bat, the option is available to do an eBird checklist just as usual and import that data into the Atlas. Now we'd really highly prefer that it went the other way. It's, it really is easy and seamless, but it's best to record your checklists in the Atlas program first because more details required. Breeding evidence, plus if your eBird checklist covers more than uh, crosses a boundary between squares, the data in the checklist won't be, might not be suitable at all. So that is an option, but I will show you how, and I'm going to suggest, select the home square. So much more data is available. So much more data is available um, on this new online approach. Very um, detailed information can be provided about where in the square birds and the checklist has been. So if you uh, are doing a traveling count, you can zoom in. All you need to do is click and draw a transect. Perhaps you walked on Springfield Golf Club back to Paul's Pond and that is that your checklist for that day will be tied to that specific location which is extremely helpful. Same can be done by drawing an area, a polygon for an area search. For my example, I'm going to pick a single location. Um, let's pretend that I went out last night and heard duetting great horned owls one more time. So the date would have been last night, 24 hour clock, I'll say eight o'clock. Now, it, I didn't go out specifically to look for the owl, so I'm going to not it's going to be an incidental observation, just like eBird. And I will continue. Ooh. Oh, I did forget to do that, didn't I? Good. Where I saw the other one. All right, and then you have the option to enter your checklist here. Again, if you had this on your phone in the field, it would be done by the time you got home. But if you are recording from a notebook, you would enter the species as they occurred and you can enter them with their English names. Or if you're familiar with the four letter codes, it's quite a bit quicker 
to find them that way. Really. <laughs> Okay. Really, it worked every other time I tried. There we are. So let's say it was two again duetting, but because it was more than a week ago since I heard the same pair, we'll call it a territory. Now I would note that some of these codes are inappropriate for bald, uh, for great horned owls. You may know that Great horned owls don't build their own nests. So if I select NP for nest building, it's going to pop up with uh, an error message. And it's got incredible detail. Isn't that awesome? It's, it's got just incredible detail on the species. In this case, it tells you the great horned owl does not build a nest. You can also see, um, you know, it lets you know that male and females look alike, that the young of the species, you can't use fecal sac carrying. It's, it's just uh, going to make sure that the data is so clear right off the start. So we'll delete that and choose T for territory, which it should be much more happy with. Now, I would just submit this checklist. I'm not going to do it today, but that's it. That's uh, data is in. The exciting thing about this is data is updated in real time. Again, I can't tell you how different that is from previous atlases when the goal was to have everything entered by the end of the calendar year. Uh, it's just wonderful to be able to explore the data. Um, yeah, again, uh, exploring the data if we look at our region. Still trying to figure out if there's a way to set it up for Wellington. But there is our squares. There they are catching up. And if this is a coverage map for my square 17 and J61 that we were just looking at, I'm afraid this uh, internet is a bit slow catching up. There we are. It tells you all about the square. It tells you how many forms have been submitted, how many participants, how many different atlasers have contributed, the number of records, the number of species. And this uh, part is only accessible to regional coordinators. So I do thank Gard for allowing me to use uh, his square as my example square tonight. This is an excellent tool for if you're looking to um, contribute in a square that you're not the primary atlaser for. It helps you identify gaps where perhaps the number of um, the effort in hours or the number of point counts is low. Um, yeah, if I'm not going to click on it, but if I, if it would go to the summary square, uh, this square summary sheet once again, uh, showing which species have been recorded and which haven't. Good. Oh. The final thing, which is very important, is to show how to sync with eBird. I'm logged in here, as most people will have, everyone who's registered for the Atlas will have a nature count account now. Under profile, scroll down almost to the end, and there's eBird exports. All you need to do is put in your login and password. You can even automatically push your Atlas information to eBird as soon as you've entered it. So you only need to enter once and it will be used both for the Atlas and go to eBird for all of your personal lists and so forth. Again, just can't say how exciting it is to have this data available so readily and to eBird and to so many people um, in such real, real time. But I'm going to try and switch back to the slideshow without losing everyone again, so bear with me. Can you share? All right. Oh, I did just quickly want to again reinforce uh, or show the safe date. People are raring to get going. Uh, it is time to start looking, or we can start counting 
the screech owl and the great horned owl. The rock pigeon is also breeding and crossbill. But actually, I'm just gonna see if there are any questions on that subject. I'll just, if you could uh, bear with me as I open the chat and read through. I have one question, does the nature count app automatically save the track record? Is it viewable while birding? I have not tried that. I believe it is, I believe it is. I can get back to you on that. And nature count, yes, I think we uh, explained about how nature, the Atlas data is important to eBird. A question, do they have updated maps for squares with new road construction, et cetera? I'm not sure of the base that they're using there, Pat, I'm sorry. All right, good. And then I think all the other questions were related to my screen sharing problems, yeah. Oops. Chris Early had a question today. Is there a report on bird that, oh, that can be, not sure I understand that question. Um, is there a report on eBird that can be used for, yeah, I'm afraid I'm not as familiar as eBird than I, than I should be perhaps. Oh. All right, Gard Otis has a question. If a new entry for a higher level of breeding than the previous entry, yes, it will um, update uh, only the, the first record will be there um, for sure, but the breeding evidence will be upgraded, yes. In terms of uh, tapes, uh, will we be getting owl, owling audio files? Um, I believe we are going to, Yes, yes, sorry, we will be. Uh, some audio equipment will be provided. We won't have too much here, but we can loan it out. All right, and going back to the question about, let's see, higher level of breathing. Another question um, regarding relative abundance, do only the point counts contribute? And that's correct, yes. It has to be done in a standardized timed format so that the relative abundance can be calculated. Oh, um, I guess this is a follow-up to Chris Early's. Can he use someone else's report on eBird that is from his patch? I'm not sure I will have to find that out for Chris. Ah, thank you, Mike Cadman. Has answered the one question about the map version. Using the newest ones we, we can get. Oh, good point from Anna Cunningham. Audio files are available through birding apps if there isn't enough to share. Um, Otis asks, are we expected to do point counts in addition to individual records? Um, each square does need general atlasing as well as point counts. The primary atlaser is basically committing to the 20 hours of coverage. If uh, the point counts can be done by the primary atlaser or as I mentioned, we have uh, some very qualified people ready to blitz the county and help out as needed with point counts. All right. Oh, a question about access. Yes, I should have mentioned that atlasers will need to um, arrange for permission before they go on any private lands. Uh, the Atlas office won't be arranging those specifically, although there'll be some uh, general protocols um, put in place and I, I can certainly help where I can, but the Atlas office will provide some letters that are um, some letter templates that you can distribute to landowners um, and will work with conservation authorities sort of um, maybe in consultation with me. All right, I'm afraid uh, I'm gonna, how are we doing for time? Yes, we're, we've passed the 30 minutes that I wanted to allocate to this. I hope I can come back to some of these questions though because they're really good. I'm not gonna worry about questions about the OWL protocols because, um, oh my goodness, I'm way back. Yeah, I don't want to talk about the point count protocols. 
um, or the Outlink protocols because they'll be prepared and they'll be made available and I'm not sure of the details. Uh, the number of point counts is 25 squares, 25 point counts per square. The reason there are 50 labeled is that they're done in priority and if you're starting, um, if you come to one that can't be done because of construction or it's unsafe, uh, road conditions or something like that, then you eliminate that one and then you'll do uh, the next number 26, I guess. The point counts are done just once over the five years. And yes, a couple of people have chimed in there as well. Good, I'm going to go back to our, no, I am on the slideshow here. Let's get on with the, the second part of the presentation and hopefully at the end, we'll have a little extra time if there are still questions remaining. Thank you for all the excellent questions. Good. All right. In 2002, um, I traveled with three others to Northern Ontario to cover some squares for the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, this was a trip that Mike Cadman and others had made 20 years earlier during the first atlas. This uh, title page was actually taken from the ABA magazine, Birding um, magazine that we had an article published in Paul, uh, myself and Mike Cadman, a special edition on monitoring of bird populations. I wanted to include a bit of a travelogue in tonight's talk because I knew a presentation without birds pictures could be a little dull, although unfortunately our bird pictures are not that great. Uh, because we were using film cameras. This was um, before the day of digital, carrying a smartphone camera everywhere you go. Um, but also I wanted to make everyone aware that there's a huge part of Ontario that no one lives but will still need to be surveyed. We have so many keen birders in Wellington, I'm quite confident we'll have excellent coverage here. But if you're wanting to contribute in a different way, there are some remarkable opportunities in the north, even in central Ontario. If you're comfortable in the wilderness and have birding skills and you're up for quite an adventure, it could be the trip of a lifetime. It certainly was for us. So here is where we went. This is the very northern part of Ontario, as you can see in the inset map. We have four groupings of dots and those are two uh, 10, 10 by 10 kilometer squares in each of two 100 by 100 kilometer blocks. We traveled 250 kilometers over nearly three weeks from the Fawn River which is a tributary to the Severn. Um, those are the southerly, the southerly river that are, the points are located in and joined the Fawn River the Severn River, I'm sorry, and canoed all the way to Fort Severn, which is a fly-in um, Indigenous community located just a few kilometers inland from the coast of Hudson's Bay. Uh, you can see it at the delta there, and the river is just about a kilometer wide here. Uh, so in each of those target squares, each of those four target squares, we spent a minimum of 20 hours atlasing as well as conducted point counts. Um, as I mentioned, this was done the, for the first atlas as well, but we were the, in 2002, I think we were the first, one of the first, if not the first northern trip to try out the point count approach. So we were a bit of a, a trial run with respect to that. didn't have topographic maps for the north because information in that level of detail was not available. As well, it's very flat, so they wouldn't be very helpful. Instead, we had these infrared maps of vegetation. What we're looking at here um, is open water shown in the black uh, with the Fawn River running through the middle. The dark red is coniferous, mostly coniferous vegetation. Um, focused along the river. The pinkish brownish areas are fen, grassy type fens, and the white is muskeg. Well, how did we get there? Well, we had, we drove to Pickle Lake, which is as far north as you can go on roads in Ontario. It's a 24 hour drive from here, two days to drive 
um, we had two canoes strapped to the bottom of a float plane and flew another, was it one or two hours north of Pickle Lake, landing on the river. So here we have um, Antonio Salvadori, the uh, eminent Nature Gulf member, very happy to finally be on our way. We were delayed a day due to high winds and forest fires in the area. Oh, it's very important to note that while we were generally responsible for the transportation to Pickle Lake and to provide our own gear, Atlas paid for most of the expensive stuff, including the canoe rental, flights, the ground transportation within Fort Severn and the lodging there. And we are very grateful for that. So we flew in, landed on the river, dropped off the canoes, grabbed the gear out of the back, and the plane took off and left us behind. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. And here is the team. Mr. Salvadori, as I mentioned before, Paul Grant in the middle, and Reinder Westerhoff on the right. Again, a cherished member of Nature Guelph who is unfortunately no longer with us. Looking back, it seems I spent most of my evenings compiling field notes, but Paul uh, recorded a, um, kept a personal journal, which I re relied on quite heavily for this presentation. And should you do a trip like this, I can't recommend that enough. I'm sure the data forms were important and all, but the, uh, personally that journal was just wonderful to look back on. This is our first morning on the Fawn River. and our first campsite. Uh, this photo in the previous two, you'll see the um, dense coniferous forest along the edges of the river. And it went back perhaps a hundred meters or so. However, back from the river, it looked entirely different. And uh, here you can see black, uh, from the infrared map, the open water would be shown as black. The white areas were white and the coniferous trees would be shown in dark red. Uh, to quote from Paul's journal, you really wouldn't have a clue what this place is all about if you never left the river. I will mention it was certainly difficult to get around. You can see there's quite a bit of water and it was extremely soft and extremely difficult to walk on like a very soft floating mat, which is exactly what we were walking on. It, uh, you had to be careful where you stepped or you would punch through and over your boot. Um, fortunately, falling completely through wasn't a concern as long as you weren't foolhardy, I suppose. Now that uh, looks very peaceful, doesn't it? it looks gorgeous. However, <laughs> most importantly, um, you need to be prepared for bugs. If you don't like bugs, you won't like this. However, it was something that you do gradually get accl uh, acclimatized to. We did bring bug nets, which were helpful, but not when we were birding or eating, but the rest of the time it helped. Um, in fact, sometimes the bugs were loud enough that it interfered with our ability to hear the birds on point counts. And <laughs> many mornings it sounded like it was raining and it was in fact just bugs impatiently waiting for us to get out of the car. Oh, it's had time, sorry. <laughs> yes. um, another quote from Paul's journal here, after estimating that we each had over a hundred bites or more, there was a little asterisk in a footnote. I just counted and Val has at least 45 bites on the back of her right hand. So I underestimated to say the least. Spike bugs though, we had the usual highlights you'd expect from a wonderful wilderness canoe trip. We saw many wildlife, many species of wildlife. We had moose, mink, and otter. We were in bear country and we only did see bear once, but it's something to be aware of. Um, our best sighting though was from the canoe as well. Um, sighting of a lifetime was a wolverine we saw drinking from the side of the Fawn River about 15 meters away. Uh, it watched us for about 20 seconds. It was not frightened. And we all got great looks through our binoculars, but no photographs. <laughs> Aside from birds, um, the wildlife we encountered most frequently was actually woodland caribou. 
uh, don't have any pictures of those as well, unfortunately, because it was usually just a glimpse or at a big distance. But once on a point count where Paul and I were standing very quietly, as one does, um, a woodland caribou ev evidently bothered by the bugs as much as we were, came charging around a thicket and just stopped short right in front of us. Uh, we all stood shocked for some seconds uh, until we tried to take a picture and then off it ran. We soon settled in to a pattern of paddling, camping and birding. Uh, here's another camp and I would draw your attention to the tents tethered to rocks. So the, we occasionally had high winds there which was delightful for the bugs, but we also had to be careful our camp didn't blow away. We tried fishing, um, having heard from the first Atlas trip that there were many, many trout to be had, but we didn't have any luck. Um, we gave up after a few days, although it sure would have been nice to supplement our rather boring diet of powdered pretty much everything. Um, we had powdered chili, eggs, potatoes, bannock, and milk um, with some canned food and uh, other things Can thrown in. One thing quickly? Oh, sure. Yeah, this was an on again, off again trip quite a bit. And I think it was two days before we were to leave, we finally got the green light that we were going. So I think Val and I went to Bulk Barn and just bought stuff and hoped it was enough. <laughs> I can tell you, it was a very physically challenging um, trip. And food that was a meal that was perfectly sufficient for us at the beginning of the trip was not enough to feed four of us by the end. We were hungry. So, and then the birding every day. Um, as I mentioned, physical fitness, I, I had forgotten how tiring it was until I read Paul's uh, journal that that uh, repeatedly pointed out how exhausted the whole group was. Um, in addition though to the physical uh, aspect, it was mentally taxing. And certainly if you were thinking of a trip like this, you'd want to be prepared to deal with a lot of uncertainty. We had to recalibrate, do a major overhaul of our plans twice during the trip. Um, although things on paper look perfectly possible, there's still the dealing with the emotional challenge. Uh, the uncertainty surrounding the weather, the river conditions, the work you need to do and whether you're physically going to, nothing, nothing goes wrong physically. Birding was excellent. Some of the most common songbirds we saw were palm warbler, yellow warmed warbler, Tennessee warbler, rusty blackbird, fox sparrow, Lincoln sparrow, white crowned sparrow, and both species of kinglets. There are lots of bigger birds as well, is my title slide again, and it's of course a sandhill crane with, uh, if you can see the fledged youngster following behind. Um, 20 years ago, sandhill cranes were a bit more exciting than they are now, but lovely nonetheless. Um, one of the most interesting things about birding in the muskeg is that this is where our shorebirds go to nest. And we're used to seeing them on the shores, but here they're always perched on the tops of trees. The bird on the left is a Hudsonian godwit. The bird on the right is a lesser yellow legs. And we joked that the height of the perch correlated with the size of the bird, because here we have a tiny least sandpiper on the shortest stick of all. Um, the ye yellow legs in particular were ubiquitous and just relentless. We noted a couple times a, a pair would just escort us as we traveled through their territory, just squawking. Uh, following us along and suddenly some invisible territory boundary we would cross. The first pair would turn back and a second pair would suddenly approach and take over the scolding and the hassling as we, um, and the escort as we continued along. You know, some records do stand out. This doesn't look very exciting from this picture, but what we found here was the nest of a black pole warbler. It only took about 15 minutes to find this nest. Um, if point counts hadn't been quite so time consuming, we would have had more time to do this sort of work. So I did notice a trade off between finding amazing stuff like this, which we later found out was only the sixth nest that had been properly documented and measured and so forth in Ontario. Um, a trade off between this sort of find versus covering the 
the point counts in the relative abundance measurements. One other time we went a short distance to an area that had been recent, well, not even that recently uh, burned by forest fire. We were hoping for three toed or black backed woodpeckers, which we didn't find. But what did turn up is two recently fledged northern hawk owls. We did come across many uh, familiar species, I won't say common, uh, familiar species from the south. We had great horned owls, um, spotted sandpipers, and common snipe were quite abundant. Um, but we had quite a list of excellent northern specialties as well on their breeding territories. So to name just a few, we had orange crowned warbler, spruce grouse, boreal chickadee, golden eagle, pine grosbeak, and common red pole, all in their breeding condition. So after a little while, we got to the end of the fawn and got into the Severn River, which was bigger and wider. We were starting to feel pretty small. It's pretty wide open and the tents and it's, uh, it's a big space. And that's particularly concerning when it comes to weather, because although you can see it coming for a long way, it comes really quick. There was one instance when we barely had time to get our canoes out of the water, unloaded, throw a tarp over everything and hide. And uh, here are Tony Salvadori and Reinder Westerhoff sheltering in place, uh, just waiting for the rain to go, even though we were only 500 meters from where we wanted to camp. Uh, we, and I'm really glad we did because I wouldn't want to be out on the river in rain like that. The other thing we had to look forward to was a set of rapids, the limestone rapids. Now it doesn't look that bad from here, but uh, those rapids are two kilometers in length. The river is well over three quarters of a kilometer wide at this point. I took this picture as we flew out, but from the ground, this is what it looked like. Now we were, we could hear it over a kilometer upstream before we hit it. Um, the way we passed through, fortunately, we were prepared for it from uh, reports and from our top, from our maps. Uh, we lined the canoes through with a, a rope on the front and the back, made our way through. It took two hours to get the two canoes, the two kilometers. It was quite slippery and quite physically demanding and an experience just in itself. So once we passed through the rapids, our intensive birding was done, but we had a two day trip out. At this time we were traveling uh, easily 10 to 14 kilometers per hour uh, with the speed of the river. Um, so covering 50 kilometers that first day was no problem. So this was our last campsite on the river. You can see this is July 19th and there's quite a bit of ice and snow there still. But this was a lovely site. The highlight, no doubt, was 20 or more Arctic terns, which we watched fly catch all evening there. Our last day, um, our last full day on the river, we were able to just do general atlasing. We were able to find some different habitats and new birds along this oxbow lake and uh, quite a lovely sight indeed. Now we'd been on the river for 17 or 18 days at this point and the rapids had actually insulated us from boat traffic coming upstream from Fort Severn. So we started seeing boats and we managed to talk to a few people. And uh, the last day though, we did have some very strong headwinds and the last 30 kilometers was very, very challenging and it took a while, but we ended up Fort Severn. I'll just add, we were really lucky that we ran into uh, um, some native people who warned us which side of the river to be on. We would have been in real trouble actually if we hadn't crossed at a particular, I can't remember the point, but yes. they really saved us. <laughs> yes, there were some, I thought your notes say there were standing yeah. waves in between the island yeah. and that, yeah. It was a big, scary river at times. Yeah, but the, the canoes were extremely stable. Oh, yeah. uh, it was excellent to see Fort Severn. Um, I've just got a few shots here. The adults, uh, the community members weren't terribly outgoing and not very communicative, but the children were very friendly. Um, 
I guess we were quite the novelty. We were the first canoe trip to have come down the river that year, arriving in on July 20th. Usually they only have two or three trips arrive anyways in any given year. So the kids uh, asked us first if we were cowboys because of our Tilly hats. Um, they were quite taken with Paul's blue eyes. <laughs> Here are just a few pictures. Not too many birds, surprisingly. I think we got our house sparrow there though. Good, and then we did have regular visitors. Here are a couple of delightful young girls who have apparently successfully uh, managed to find some orange juice and some fruit roll-ups in our house. Yeah. Oh yes, we uh, they allowed the community allowed us to stay in the teachers' quarters because it was summer. There was no schools and therefore no teachers in residence, but uh, they allowed us to stay for free in the teachers' residence. I I think the Atlas would have been perfectly happy to pay for the hotel support the community mm -hmm. so they were very generous doing that yeah. Yeah. yeah but it was i think it's just in tony's dna he has to get a deal <laughs> so good so we had two nights and um yes two yes two full nights so one day in which to do some atlasing along the coast of hudson's bay uh, the atlas rented some atvs so that we could get out to the coast and this is the sort of habitat we drove through. Um, the burden was pretty quiet, but of course by now we're July 21st and the ATVs aren't ideal for birding. Um, yeah, not a lot of great birds. I think also it's pretty heavily traveled despite appearances um, being fairly close to town. However, we did get a new bird, yellow rail, life for yellow rail, and actually probably the only yellow rail I've ever heard before, um, as well as tundra swans. We reached the coast, and there it is, the coast of Hudson's Bay. Uh, the tide was out, as you can see. And although we had just seen sandpipers a few days previous inland on their breeding territories, there were already large flocks massing here to begin their southbound migration. So their breeding, breeding seasons are short and rushed. And off they go back south. There is our crew, Rinder, myself and Tony, along with a couple of local guides. Took this photo as we were leaving, just to give a little context again, through a window not at all intended for photography. And you can see in the distance, Hudson's Bay, the Delta of the Severn River, and the town of about 500 residents. Uh, fly-in community only. The community had suggested uh, we might see polar bears because the ice was finally going out of the bay and the polar bears would be coming on, uh, on land. We were disappointed on that front, or maybe disappointed's not the word because I am not sure I wanted to run into one of those in person. That concludes that portion. I am going to check the chat to see if there are any questions about our trip. All right. There's lots of comments I see. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, thanks for your comments, everybody. It was a fantastic opportunity. Would we go back? You know, I would love to. I, The physical fitness aspect of it, if I could get myself back in that shape that I was 19 years ago, I, I would. I would love to. I would love to. Paul's journal said he wanted to stay a few more days out. Mm -hmm. He was. He, we were on the river for two, more than two and a half weeks, another two days in Fort Severn four days of driving to pick a lake and back. Yeah, I hope you don't mind me answering that question as yeah. well. Um, I would most certainly consider it if I could figure out just the logistics of home. But another thing that would be extremely important is who you go with. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you are trusting your life to your partner. So you would want to know who you're with and, and that you basically trust them with your life. <laughs> 
Yeah, the, the risky situations we had were the rapids and the other canoe did, um, the other canoe did get hung up. We got hung up once. Yeah. We almost dumped in that windstorm. We were really close, Yeah, um, which would have been a real disaster. Yeah. To lose your food, lose everything. Um, who knows what you get back and then you're going to what walk you're for uh, <laughs> walk away from 100 kilometers you. through the bog. Yeah. I think I think there's more safety now too with communication. Uh, I would definitely be strapping one of those uh, GPS that has uh, um, has the ability to text out and, yeah. and whatnot, which I've used before. It's amazing how much the technology has changed in 20 years, alone 40 from when Mike and crew went the first time. Yes, indeed. What would your number one tip be to anyone? Well, probably the thing about choosing your companions mm. very well. Yeah. To be we had a mentally, physically time. prepared, and and yeah. know your know your friends who you're with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we uh, we had a fabulous time. All right. Yeah, great. All right. Um, I would just like to recap. So, birding opportunities. There are plenty of birding opportunities in terms of atlasing. Um either here in Wellington, anytime you're out birding anyways, but you can contribute even more if you head out and just in Southern Gray County, just north of our own county, uh, they're having a lot of trouble covering those squares, as well areas that aren't inhabited like Algonquin Park or any other park or cottage area, places that you might tend to vacation. Keep the atlas in mind, make sure you're making your bird checklists and submitting them through the app. Um, and then of course, if you're really, if you've got an interest in a Northern trip, the Atlas would be thrilled, the Atlas office would be thrilled to hear from you. Although I do understand that it may not be possible this year, um, can't take the risk of introducing COVID into those Northern communities. Now, I'm also interested, uh, looking for help in Wellington with some non-birding volunteer opportunities. Specifically, I'm looking for, uh, I'd like, love to have a local Facebook page. Um, maybe data entry will be necessary if people are not, uh, are just keeping track on forms, paper forms. And I'm definitely looking for experienced birders to mentor younger or inexperienced birders uh, to conduct perhaps workshops or online tutorials. I hope soon we'll have that chance to get together in person. Um, if you're interested in any of those opportunities, please feel free to contact me at wellington at birdsontario.org.